Toongrin.com. This episode has been paid for in part by Anubis Markets, a division of Osiris Foods. So shop at the sign of the jackal-headed man for food so good you can eat it. However, this will not affect our story in any way. Thank you. When the game of life makes you feel like quitting, it helps a lot if you kill a kitten. I'm back, baby! After a long, obligatory hiatus with a few specials in between because you guys are just so worth it, I have returned like a hack director that should just fade away. I'm back now with a whole new look, yeah, and I have a strong resolve now more than ever to destroy fucking horrible movies, but first, a few things, some minor inkling things that really get my nuts in a vice. One, animated films that flat out insult the intelligence of the audience, especially if it's kids, B, vegetables in my salad, and three, piss poor movies that have more than a generous budget, and despite, despite having such a generous budget, Somehow, that money doesn't seem to go to the movie itself, but instead rather disappear than is spent on some other frivolous stuff. <laughs> and this film? If you can call it that. You know, this is all part of the ploy too, and this is no exception to that rule. This piece of shit came out at the exact same time as the DreamWorks Puss in Boots. So I'm sure many parents went there, you know, went, picked it up, thought, Hey, you know what? Puss in Boots is the same thing, right? Well, <laughs> you'd be fucking wrong! And this piece of shit was a ploy to get our fucking money. MISSION ACCOMPLISHED! Our movie begins utilizing what I can only describe as the most stock music imaginable. Now, I'm not the most musically inclined individual. Hell, to be quite honest, I find the music in My Little Pony Friendship is Magic to be rather catching and kick-ass. We're saying you've got Now, I can't really give my full critique on this music, but my buddy Jason is a bit more musically inclined, so I think he can give a better opinion than I could. So after a grueling two minutes of just opening credits, which I swear to God it felt a lot longer, the story starts with Charles Perrault, the same Charles Perrault who's the, in fact, actual author of the actual story of Puss in Boots that was written in 1697. So, this movie, which is only two minutes in, is trying to blur the lines of reality with a fairy tale. You're kidding. You're kidding, right? What kind of sense does this make? It's a fucking fairy tale. Why would you try to blur the lines of reality with a fucking fairy tale? You know it's fake! That's why it's a fairy tale! <laughs> Moving along, we meet our villain, the Chamberlain. And yes, he is called the Chamberlain. He does not actually get a name, which is the standard for this film. And you can tell that he's our villain because, well, look at him. Does he look like any other normal human being? This is a recurring problem I have with Disney villains. I mean, think about it. Yzma looks like some sort of undead carcass. Scar's some kind of evil douchebaggery version of Mufasa. And Jafar looks like Osama fucking Bin Laden! So the Chamberlain babbles on about the somewhat dilemma of the film. It seems the princess has to marry because... Well, what else does a princess do? I mean, besides getting abducted all the time. And of course the Chamberlain, being the villain, he wants to marry her! Despite- Okay, what the fuck is up with the camera work in this scene? God, do you want to give the kids a fucking seizure? Assholes! Anyway, this is our princess who, I don't know if it's just me, but doesn't she totally look like a he, and by he, I totally mean Justin fucking Bieber if he ever managed to hit puberty? Enters Peter, who is our protagonist. Yeah, the film is only called The True Story of Puss in Boots, so clearly the main character should be Puss in Boots' owner and not the cat itself. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. It's like calling Pokemon, Pokemon, but instead of focusing on the pocket monsters, 
We focus on the fucking prick in the head. No one cares about the prick in the fucking head. Kids just want to see the fucking pocket monsters. Sorry. So Peter's father named... Dad, I guess. Well, he dies, leaving his two elder sons to mill. So, you know, the business to, you know, allow them to survive. And Peter gets the house. Cat. Yeah, Peter gets the house cat. And some leather to make a pair of boots for the cat. You have to be a pretty terrible freaking child in order for your parents to leave you nothing but the house cat. I mean, the dad doesn't talk about the cat's capability to talk, or that the leather for the boots is magic. He just pretty much says, Joy, Peter! I've always loved you the least. <laughs> Now we meet the star of this delightful film, Puss in Boots, played by William Shatner. Yeah, you know, the possum dad from Over the Hedge. But don't worry, I'm sure he does a much better job here than he did in that. Okay, 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 let's be calm. I just meant with higher heels I could, you know, with the ladies. <laughs> you, yeah, you, you know, no, 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 never mind. I think they're going to be fine. They could be. Wow! Stop it! Jesus H. Christ! I haven't seen a performance this shitty since... I got it. I'm gonna make you look good up there, don't worry, okay? Now let's get these pants off and fly some planes. So we get a display of what the boots can do, and if I had to guess, they grant super speed. I mean, I would assume they are what allows Puss the ability to talk, but that's never established. We never see Puss without the boots at first. So, as far as I'm concerned, the cat can just talk. And Peter takes this pretty well. I mean, he doesn't seem shocked at all that his house pet is talking to him. And this is another weird occurrence where I have to ask, is this normal? Do all the animals talk in this world? What happens if it's an animal you need to prepare for food? Boy, it sure is good to be alive. Is that a slaughterhouse? <laughs> Yummy! So Peter is kicked out of his home, I guess. It's never said, but he doesn't live at home with his brothers. I'm just gonna assume they threw his ass out. So Peter handles this very well. He takes his pussy, and he heads down to the local bar where he meets a mysterious dancer. Gee, I wonder who this could be. I mean, it could be anybody. Although I think her singing is a dead giveaway of who it is. Now with the Chamberlain, who is working in his secret lab, here he makes magical candies that turn people into animals. He's been doing this with the princess's suitors, turning them into toads, and then sending them over to the ogre to be eaten. So, was this in the original story of Puss in Boots? Oh, who am I kidding? This is the true story of Puss in Boots! The real fucking deal! Anyways, back to Peter, Puss, and a talking Rastafarian monkey. Don't... Don't put too much thought into it. I mean, the writers of the fucking film clearly didn't. Yeah, so Peter, Puss, and Marcel, the Rastafarian monkey, head to Marcel's house, where Peter now lives too! He lives with the monkey that's just below the ogre's castle. Seems kind of dangerous in the grand scheme of things. See, Marcel actually apparently works as a musician for the ogre. It's explained that whenever the ogre gets upset, he turns into... Octahulk thing, and Marcel's music somehow calms him down. You're saying strange things. Stop it. So together, our idiots form a plan to have Peter pose as the Marquis of Carabas. Yes, because when dealing with royalty, it's always good to lie about who you are and what you do. After all, there are no consequences for doing things of this kind of nature. By the way, the singer at the bar? Yeah, it was the princess. And I'm not just plugging this in right here, the movie does it too, there's no real resolve to it. So the next morning, everyone's least favorite cat pays the king and queen a visit, telling them lies upon lies, thus only digging Peter deeper into a grave should he ever be found out for the lying fucker that he is. His castle is magnificent, grand. If you come to the ball without the Marquis of Carabas, <laughs> it's a grinder. So yeah, Puss lies up a storm, spouting out enough bullshit to easily make up the script for the next Star Wars film. Right 
So after lying, Puss decides to go and wander around the castle. <laughs> Liar. Wanders around aimlessly around places he shouldn't. Great protagonist. And he finds his way to the Chamberlain's lab, where he gets some shape-shifting candies that will be used later in the disappointing climax. Later that night, Peter, Puss, and Marcel go to visit the Ogre's castle, where we get to see the Ogre and the Chamberlain plotting together. See, the Chamberlain made a deal with the Ogre. In exchange for eating the suitors that the Chamberlain turned into toads, he promised the Ogre that he'd give him a magic candy that would allow for the Ogre to turn into whatever he desired most. Okay, well, what could the Ogre possibly want to turn into the most? But it never happens. Isn't there a candy that can turn me into a swan? Oh my god, are you serious? You know what? You know what, Ogre? Turn in your man card, okay? It's being fucking revoked. So the dumbass duo set up a stage meeting between the king and queen by having Peter hide out naked in a river. Oh, for fuck's sake, come on, people. Even in the original book, that couldn't have made any sense. So now posing as the Marquis of Carabas, Peter rides to the castle where he gets a new pair of clothes and an invitation to the ball, where he gets to meet the princess who learns that he is a peasant by using a magic eyeglass. I'm not making this shit up, people. She just says it's her grandma's. That's it. What the fuck was her grandmother? A witch or something? Was she burned at the stake? What's that story? That sounds far more interesting than where we're at right now. There is no explanation to why the eyeglass is magic. It just is. That's bullshit. Speaking of bullshit, you guys gotta see this moment. This has to be one of the worst singing moments ever put to a film. When you sat so close to me, the world around me started to... And when you took my hand in yours, I swear my heart just started burning. And? My love is not so deep for my turkeys and my sheep. Even if they go gobble, 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 even if they go gobble. This course is the feces that is produced when shame eats too much stupidity. You people make me envy the deaf and the blind. Oh, and Peter's brothers happen to be here at the ball too, where they meet the Chamberlain and tell him everything. Mr. Chamberlain, this is the third time I've told you that your Marquis of Carabas is our little brother Peter. Hmm. And the cat is the one from our mill. We already told you this. Dang. I guess the French really take the whole bros before hoes thing to heart. So the next day, Peter rides in a carriage with the royal family as they go across the land, meeting the royal subjects of the Marquis of Carabas. Now some of you might be wondering, Nero, why would they lie for Peter? Do they know Peter? No. No, my faithful viewers, they do not know Peter. And you want to know why they lie for him? Well, they lie for him because Puss straight out threatens them if they don't. <laughs> Oh, the queen has one just like that. But hers is for grinding up farmers. What's that supposed to mean? It means that if the queen asks a question and you don't answer correctly, you'll be all chopped up. <laughs> Hamburger meat. Wait, let's watch the lip sync, okay? Thank you. So after blackmailing villagers, Puss goes to the ogre's castle, where honestly, I think the ogre may have originally been written with the intention to being a sympathetic character. I mean, just listen to him. Think about swans. Ooh, well, they're my specialty. Really? And you're a magician. Oh, I dabble. And you? Me? I get tired. It's too difficult. It's not possible. But well, guys, as you can plainly see, the crap is starting to really pile up one after the other, isn't it? You know what I think it's time for? I think it's time. I can feel it. It's time for a Clusterfuck Climax! So Peter arrives with the royal family while the fight goes on in the lower chambers. And of course, no one's the wiser. Then the Chamberlain, along with Peter's brothers, arrive at the castle to tell the truth about the so-called Marquis. Then we jump back to the ogre who is ready to kill Puss, but Princess Beaver comes in and starts singing. So 
So somehow the prattlings of Princess Beaver calms the ogre, who again shows his much more sympathetic side. Oh, now, now. Everything is going to be fine. <laughs> it won't. Everything won't be fine. <laughs> I want to be a swan. That's my dream. <laughs> Come on, that's lame. So the ogre, who just wants to be a beautiful swan, is then tricked by Puss, our protagonist, so our good guy, and gets tricked into eating a candy that makes him a duck. <laughs> Majesty! Yeah, the ogre just wants to be a beautiful swan, and the cat turns him into a duck. And the clusterfuck just ends. The princess, who never got a name in this film, marries Peter. They agree to... I guess off camera they keep up the lie because the truth is never revealed in this movie about either of them being liars, her dancing at the nightclub, him not being a fucking marquee, and the ogre is now a duck so Peter just steals his fucking house! The end! <laughs> That's since Green Lantern has there been such a colossal clusterfuck of a climax. <laughs> My god, these characters just suck! Peter is a liar, the princess is a liar, and Puss in Boots is a liar. So basically, all of our major protagonists are liars. The Chamberlain does not come off as villainous, he comes off as an annoying prick, and the ogre comes off as this sad whoopee. I honestly think doing a retelling where the ogre is a sympathetic creature being used while the real monster is a human pulling the strings is a good concept. There is merit in that idea, and executed properly, it could be good. But this? This is evidence of an idea that fails due to poor execution. William Shatner is terrible in this, and honestly, I'm a bit surprised at how bad he was in this. He did a much better job in Over the Hedge, but here, it sounds like he was trying to do a cartoony voice when it didn't warrant a cartoony voice. Oh, oh, you know, you know that. Oh, oh, you know, reading in life, it's uh, 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 so minor. It's just so minor. It's a uh, ooh, reading. It's so. The irony that Puss in Boots was in fact a book before it was this animated hunk of shit, and the film is telling you not to read. Classy. I even showed this movie to a friend who summed it up best by saying, "Puss sounds like a pedophilic grandmother." I'll get you, my pretty, and your little dog too. <laughs> And honestly, I don't think he's wrong on this. I won't lie, I wasn't expecting too much. It is a direct-to-DVD movie. But even those have potential and sometimes warrant being pretty good. I mean, the cover looks pretty decent. Look at him. He's got a sword. It looks like he's kind of swashbuckling or something. There could be some really cool action in this, right? No! He doesn't even get the sword throughout the whole film. This cover was made strictly to just be the cover. It's not even really associated with the movie. And the CGI is okay. It's really not that bad. It is probably better than I've seen compared to other films I've reviewed in the past. It beats the reef and it beats the dolphin really easily but it's still not up to par with any company like Pixar or DreamWorks. This movie, best described, is an hour and 20 minutes of pure, shoddy, heinous, imbecilic trash. Or as I like to call it... <laughs> and around here, we know how to deal with shit. This here, this is my shit bin. This is where I toss all the shit I come across. I'm Nero and I'm just saying, what the fuck is wrong with us? Assessment, retrospective, re-evaluation, and recapitulation. Ah!